yesterday. Yesterday I left a couple of topics out from the sixth chapter, so I'll cover those to begin with. We were learning about meditation and how that can help us attach our mind to God and through that we purify our heart and through that we get all kinds of benefits but it, they're in two main categories. One is that through heart purification the negativities of the mind are reduced. Worldly desires and attachments are also naturally reduced. And on the positive side, our affinity for God, which is the true sign of bhakti. Affinity means you feel a liking for Krishna. You feel a pull towards him. You feel like you belong to him and he is yours. That's affinity. That affinity in the heart, which comes so naturally for worldly people, is very difficult to come by for God. But if we get that feeling in the heart for Krishna, that is called bhakti. And that comes through repeatedly trying to attach our mind to him. This process is done in a quiet place where you sit to meditate, maybe you listen to kirtan. You try to remember God wholeheartedly. That can be done for part of the day, but not the whole day. You have other things you need to do in your life. You have physical duties and responsibilities, family, social duties. All of this has to be attended to. So Sri Krishna gives us some guidelines for the rest of our life as well. He says, don't just think that the, the time you spend sitting in meditation, that that's the only important time. Nātyaśnatastu yogosti na chaikānta manaśnata na chāti svapna shīlasya jāgrato naiva chārjuna yuktāhār viharasya yukta cheshtasya karmasu yukta svapna vabodhasya yogo bhavati dukhaha he says that the rest of our living has to be balanced and healthy also. Literally, he's telling Arjun, this path, meaning the path of God-realization, and I've been telling you the whole week that the path of God-realization is for everybody. It's not just for a sannyasi living in the jungle. It's just a matter of attaching your mind to God. It's a process. Your mind becomes 100% attached. He graces you you become God-realized. And that means you get perfect happiness. So he says this path of God-realization is not for someone who fails to sleep at all, nor for someone who sleeps too much. So it's not for the one who sleeps too much, nor for the one who sleeps too little. And he also says it is not for the one who eats too little, nor for the one who eats too much. Yukta Yukta means in, with intelligent balance. Take aha. Aha means what you put in your body. And <clears throat> there should be an intelligent balance in your approach to the food you eat, the way you sleep also should be regulated. And he says our behavior, our actions should also be regulated. They should be balanced and good. It's impossible to compartmentalize our mind. Say like, with this part of my mind, I'll do bhakti to God. So I'm purifying my mind through that. And the rest of the day, I'm careless. I don't do a good job at my work. I ignore my family responsibilities. I behave poorly with others. But it's okay because I'm doing bhakti, I'm attaching my mind to God. No, it doesn't work that way. You're spending 20 minutes purifying your mind when you're doing bhakti and the rest of the day you're dragging more impurity into it. So Krishna says the rest of the day also has to be balanced, healthy and good. It's a whole lifestyle. 
There's a story of Gautam Buddha. He was sitting, doing meditation without eating for days. And he was starting to feel dizzy and weak. And some village ladies came walking by, they were carrying some things, and just a bunch of them walked by, and as they walked, they were singing a song. And the meaning of the song was, if you, you, you have the pampura, you know, that you play as a background for music, if you turn the, its keys too much and tighten it too much, the string will snap. And if it's too loose, you won't get any sound out of it either. So you can't have it too loose and you can't have it too tight. It has to be just right. So Gautam Buddha thought to himself, what a deep philosophy. You need just enough food, not too much, not too little, just enough sleep, not too much, not too little. Then the mind is balanced. Then we can use it for meditating on God. If the mind is always disturbed by everything we're doing the rest of the day, then it's much more difficult to gain the real benefit from meditating on God during that small amount of time that we have to actually set aside for meditation. <coughs> the two have to go together. The meditation we do should help us stay in a more spiritual state of mind throughout the rest of the day, and we also try to maintain that spirituality through our daily activity. Krishna goes to this point of saying, Yo maam pasyati sarvatra The one who sees me everywhere. How do you see God everywhere? Well, initially, for us, it's not possible to see him everywhere. But he's saying that's the goal. Yo maam pasyati sarvatra sarvam cha mai pasyati tasyaham na pranasyami sachame na pranasyati then a person would never feel far from me, Krishna says. I wouldn't be far from him and he wouldn't be far from me. <coughs> That's basically what we're doing when we meditate, right? You close your eyes and you remember Krishna's here. That's how I taught you to meditate yesterday. That's meditation on the path of bhakti. So you're remembering that he is everywhere, so he is here in front of you. You remember that when you meditate. You focus on that fact that he's right here. Then the rest of the day we tend to forget. And when we maybe in the morning we did some devotion, so we remembered, oh God is right here. We thought of him, we thought of him being right there. Then we forgot him the whole day. And then at night before bed we did a few minutes more devotion and remembered, oh yes, God is watching me. God is here with me. So what happened to the other 23 hours and 30 minutes? We forget. So the goal is to bring that remembrance into the rest of our day as much as possible. Because it's a fact the rest of the day as well. <laughs> We're remembering the fact when we meditate that God is here with us. And then the rest of the day we forget. The goal is to keep remembering. Are we ever alone? No, we're never alone. But how often do we actually remember that? To give you a practical insight into your own mind, you'll realize, think about, this goes for all of us, myself included, think about how you speak to people, how polite you are, how humble you are, how humble would you be if God was in the same room listening to you talk to that person? Big change in our mental approach, right? Big change. Well, God is there, but how often do we actually speak to someone with that feeling that God is standing right here watching this conversation? How polite would we be to that person? So it means most of the time we are forgetting. The majority of the time we're forgetting. And it's to our spiritual de detriment. It's also to our emotional, mental detriment. If you remember that God is here, then it means you can get through anything. 
you can manage, you can survive anything because God is right here. It gives you strength, if you remember. It gives you strength and it also gives you discipline to be a better person, to be more humble, more polite, more respectful, not do wrong things that we know are wrong. Krishna could have given that answer in the third chapter too. When Arjuna asked him, why do people do wrong things even though they know it's wrong? So Krishna's answer was that if the desire is strong enough, it overpowers your discrimination and then even if you know it's wrong, you do it anyway, you're just out of the desire for that thing. He could have added to that, when you forget that I'm watching you, then you do <laughs> wrong things freely, liberally. See, like a child, if his parents are watching, he doesn't do anything wrong. When he thinks he's alone, then he'll do whatever he can get away with. Freely, as quick as he can, until he, oh, then he again becomes. <laughs> I didn't do anything. So we do that with God. We try to act like, me. oh, when I come in the temple, God is watching. We definitely think that when we're in the temple. But in what scripture does it say that God lives in the temple? He doesn't live outside the temple. God is everywhere. So to the extent we remember that God is with us and watching us, to the same extent we'll be better people. We won't do wrong things. Someone was saying the other day when we were talking that uh, even if a five-year-old child is watching you, you'll stop from doing a wrong thing. They may or may not understand what you're doing is wrong, you still won't do it, even if a five-year-old is watching. But God is watching and we don't care. If no other human being is watching, then we think, oh, I'm getting away with it. Even our thoughts are not private. We think, whatever I'm thinking, nobody else knows. I can think whatever I want, any kind of nasty thought. But God knows everything we're thinking. We forget that part too. So, in other words, we have no privacy. Zero privacy. Like the window shades are always open. <laughs> you know, at night you all put the window shades down in your house because you don't want anyone to see in your house. Our window shades are always open to God. Total transparency. He sees everything. Remembering that is a practice. It's a spiritual practice. It's an effort. It's like lifting weights. You want your body to get stronger? Then you have to work it out. You have to exercise it. And keep increasing what you're doing. Increase your distance. Increase the weight. Then you'll get stronger and stronger and stronger. So, Kripaluji Maharaj, my Guruji, he gives a very practical way that you can exercise this spiritual practice. He says, when you start your work, if you work in an office or maybe you go to school or the place where you spend your day, maybe you stay at home. <coughs> so wherever you are in that room, create a place where Krishna is there. So when you start your morning's work, just for a moment, look in that place and say, Krishna is standing right there. You see him standing there or maybe he's sitting. <clears throat> could be in the air, could be standing on the ground, where? He's right there. Then do your work as if you have that feeling that my boss is watching me. Sometimes your boss watches from over your shoulder, right? You keep working. You, you keep your mind in your work, but you're still somewhat conscious of the fact you're being watched. It's not so distracting that you can't work. You just realize that someone's watching me, so I better be on my best behavior. Like kids are when the teacher is watching them from behind. In the same way, Krishna's there. He's your boss for the day. He's your teacher for the day. No one else can see him? Fine, you can see him. He's there. He's watching you. So you start your day like that. Now, it's our mental habit to forget, so that constant remembrance for most people will not stay. So what you need to do is every hour on the hour, stop what you're doing. You won't get in trouble from the teacher, you won't get in trouble from your boss. You stop for a couple of seconds, just like 
when you're working, 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 you just glance at the clock, right? Oh, what? How long till lunch? Nobody gets in trouble for glancing at the clock. So in the same way, you stop what you're doing for a second, you look at that place where Krishna is, and you remember, oh, Krishna is here. So then that last hour where you forgot, that will break that. Now you remember again. And jo garbar andar chal raha tha, usme break lag jayega. So, every hour on the hour you do that for the whole day. At least you'll remember him six, eight, ten times throughout the day, which is better than we normally do. <laughs> normally the whole day goes by and then we realize, oh, I didn't think of him even once. So you practice that for a while, then increase the weight. How? Make it every 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes you stop what you're doing just for a moment and look. Okay, Krishna is watching me. You get used to that, do it every 15 minutes. By the time you get to every 15 minutes, it becomes like a habit, almost like a compulsion. <laughs> Even before the 15 minutes comes up, you'll be remembering, oh yeah, he's watching, oh yeah, he's watching. Then it becomes like a natural part of your consciousness. It doesn't happen in one day. It takes effort, just like training for the Olympics. You don't even do that in one year. It takes years of training for the Olympics. So we're training for the spiritual Olympics. And the, the event is how much can you remember Krishna in one day. So we need to increase that more and more and more. Then see the results. That's the practice. What results you get, you'll have to experience for yourself. But it's the same what I was talking about. You'll, your behavior will change. You'll get more peace of mind. Through this process, you're also purifying your heart. So you're getting the benefit of reducing from inside those negativities like anger and jealousy and hatred. And you're developing more attachment to Krishna. So you're progressing towards God-realization every day when you're practicing this. And in addition to that, you take some time out where you stop all of your worldly activity and just meditate on Krishna, meditate on His presence in front of you. Do it while you do puja, while you do kirtan, but the meditation has to be there. This is the practical path. It's not difficult, is it? I didn't tell you anything that you don't already know how to do. But it takes a commitment. You have to decide that that's my goal and every day I'm going to work towards that. You have to implement it yourself. At the end of the sixth chapter, Arjuna asks a question which is of interest to all of us. He says, Shri Krishna, what if someone is practicing this? They are implementing this in their life but they die before their heart is fully purified, so they die before they get God realized. What happens to that person? Is all of their progress washed out? So Krishna said, no, nothing is lost. Shuchi nam shri yoga bhrashto bhijayate Additionally, he says, Athava yogi nameva kule bhavati dhimatam. He says, according to that person's mental state of mind, they'll be reborn. And they'll continue where they left off. So if someone was beginning on the path, but they were still very attached in the world, but they were starting to try to go in that spiritual direction. So they'll be reborn in a spiritual family, but a worldly family, where there's a lot of, still, worldly uh, attachment and complications, but a spiritual family, and they'll continue from where they left off. That sanskar will be there. Part of our destiny is not only the birth we're given, but also the sanskars which we formed in previous lifetimes which are actually subtle imprints on the mind caused by our thoughts. So we create devotional sanskars by doing devotion in the way that I'm describing. Those sanskars will be given to us in our next life as part of our internal destiny. 
So we'll have a natural inclination at some point in our life to go towards God. Then it's up to us to follow that and progress further. No one can do that for us. God gives us the sanskar. We created that sanskar. He gives us the result in this life. So whatever natural inclination you have towards God, God gave you that based on the devotion you did in past lifetimes. Yeah, you created the sanskar, but God still has to give you that destiny. So then we have to do something with it. We have to progress further. And he says if someone was a little more spiritually evolved and they were more detached from the world, they'll also be born in a good devotional family, which is more or less tangled up in worldly matters and he'll have a more clear, uh, less complicated um, progress in his, as he wants to progress further towards God. So nothing is lost, you continue from where you left off. These are the main points from the sixth chapter. <coughs> the seventh chapter is full of philosophy. So much philosophy that I won't make, through, make it through the whole chapter today. I'll have to continue the next time I come, maybe later this summer. But we'll at least look at a few verses from the seventh chapter. In the beginning, Sri Krishna says, Manushyanam sahasreshu kashchidyatati siddhaye yatatam api siddhanam kashchimam vititatvata He says it's very rare for someone to actually consider attaining him. For someone to really want to know him is rare. Even amongst all of us sitting here, how many of us actually consider it a possibility, a real possibility in this life? There are very few people who really feel that from inside, that yes, it's possible, and I want to do it. He says that's rare. And out of all those who feel some inclination in that way, very few of them will actually act upon it and do something. And out of all of them, very few of them will actually continue their effort. It's not that the effort is difficult, but you have to decide to do it, then you do it, then you keep doing it until you get there. So he says, of all the people who try to attain me, very few of them keep going until they get to me. So, but on one hand, attaining God is very rare, but that doesn't mean it's very difficult. It just means that all of us tend to try a little bit and then get distracted, turn towards something else, or we don't believe it's possible. So out of all the souls, very few actually make the effort required to know God in this life, but it is possible. <clears throat> Shri Krishna gives some knowledge, some basic general knowledge about two of his powers. Bhumi rapo nalo vayu kham mano buddhi revacha ahankar itiyam me bhinna prakriti rashtadha Krishna has three main powers. He has uncountable powers, but out of them three are main. One is Yogamaya Shakti, which I mentioned to you the other day. That's his personal power or his internal power. One is Maya Shakti. That's his external potency or material power. 
And what is Jeev Shakti? It's all of us, all the souls. So three main powers. Everything that exists can be brought in these three categories. God and his own personal power, Yoga Maya. The world, which is produced by Maya, his material power. And then the living beings, the souls. <clears throat> those are the three things that exist, that exist. And those are the three main powers of God. Yoga Maya Shakti, Shakti means power. Maya Shakti and Jeev Shakti. Jeev means soul. He says that Maya, he's, he doesn't talk about Yoga Maya here, his personal power. He leaves, he's quiet about that. He says, Maya is my Apara Shakti and souls are my Para Shakti. Or here he uses the word Prakriti. In this context, Prakriti means power as well. Apara means Nikrisht, lower. And Para means Utkrisht, higher. So Maya is a lower power and souls are a higher power. Why? Simple, because Maya is Jara. Maya is a lifeless, mindless energy and souls have life. <laughs> so souls are considered, from this point of view, to be higher than Maya. Maya is just an energy. It doesn't have a mind, it doesn't think. It's an energy which has its own nature and it functions according to that nature. But souls have a mind, so they can think, desire, do, they're alive. So souls are God's higher power and Maya is God's lower power. Souls are Chaitan, which means they're alive, and Maya is Jarth, it's just a lifeless energy. So everything in this world is made of Maya. But whatever is alive has to have a soul. Every living thing has to have a soul. Because Maya itself has no life. It's just an energy. So my body is made of Maya. Then why does it appear to be alive? Because the soul is here. Remove the soul and what happens? <laughs> the body goes back to the earth. So its natural state is that jara state. It's only alive and functioning as an organism because the divine soul is present. And God is inside our soul, giving life to us. So this whole world is made of this lifeless mayic energy, but souls are alive, and of course God is alive. And souls have a desire to find happiness, that happiness is God. He's divine happiness. And the world is just being a lifeless material energy, it can't give the soul the type of happiness it's looking for. The soul needs real divine life happiness. That's God. Shri Krishna goes on to say, Matta parataram nanyat kinchitas tidhananjaya Mai sarvamidam protam sutre manigana iva he says, everything in this world, everything that exists, is within me. The whole universe is within Shri Krishna and all the souls are within him. Nothing can exist outside of him. Imagine, the souls are Krishna's power also because he's giving life to us. And Maya is Krishna's power because he has to keep it activated, otherwise what can Maya do? It just dissolves back into a subtle, dormant form. So Maya is his power, souls are his power, both reside, have to reside in him. A power can't reside outside of its owner. <laughs> like you have a power to hear. So you can't hear from that wall, you have to hear from your ear. The power of hearing resides within you. So God's powers also reside within him. From that point of view, it's correct to say God is everything. God is me, God is you, God is the world, God is everything. But from another point of view, it's incorrect to say because we have our own individual free will. So although we're permeated by God and we're not separate from him, physically speaking, but 
intellectually speaking, we're separate from Him. We have our own free will and God has His own free will. We perform our own actions with that free will. God gives us the power to perform those actions. How? He gives life to our soul. And with this life, our body is enlivened, our senses and mind are enlivened, and with all of this, we perform actions. But having given life to us, God does not interfere. We're not like puppets in God's hands. Otherwise, it would be totally unfair. Because look, every day we're suffering and enjoying according to our actions. Our past life's actions fructify as our suffering and enjoyment in this life. So if God were the one making us perform our actions, we, w we could take him to court and sue him. Hey, you made me perform that action. Why should I suffer the consequence? Hey, you should suffer the consequence. You made me do it. Or you can forgive yourself, but why should I suffer? You should suffer. So obviously God is not the one making us do the actions. What kind of God would he be? He's making some people do bad actions and accordingly they suffer. He makes some people do good actions so they enjoy. And he makes some people become surrendered to him so they go to his divine abode and enjoy divine bliss forever. How is he choosing who does what? No, he doesn't choose. He gives everybody life equally. Then we perform the actions and he takes note. Not literally, he just notes. And exactly according to our actions, what we call karma, he gives us the results. Whether it's the internal results in the form of some scars that I mentioned, or the external results in the form of physical suffering or comfort and pleasure. Yes, he's the one giving us the results, or he's enabling that. The law of karma is a fixed law of the universe, just like the law of gravity. And it works in a very Newtonian way. Exactly what you do, you get back somewhere down the line. Not instantly, but in some future life. <coughs> so for this reason, we should never blame God for any of our actions. You can give him credit for your good actions if you want. Oh, God must have given me some inspiration. That's why I did something good. But don't blame him for your bad actions. He's just noting what we're doing and giving us the karmic consequences. He is in no way ever interfering or making anyone do anything. We're 100% responsible. He's only indirectly responsible in the, way, in the same way that a river is indirectly responsible. The river is flowing. You go to the river and take water. What do you do with the water? The river has no responsibility. You're responsible. You can wash your hands in it. You can drink it. You can cook with it. You can drown someone in it. It was such a horrible thing, but you could do it. Is it the water's fault? No. The water is there so in the same way this power God gives is for everybody. We can do great things with it and we can do horrible things with it. That is up to us. And then we have to receive the results. We're completely free to perform the actions. God doesn't interfere there. But we have no independence when it comes to receiving the results. We're bound to receive the results. We're free to perform the actions, bound to receive the results. Wanting to be free to perform the actions and free to choose the results, no, that doesn't work. That, that makes about as much sense as saying, okay, I'm free to slap myself in the face. So I'm going to look in the mirror and slap hard on my face, but I choose not to feel pain. It doesn't work that way. If you choose to slap yourself in the face, you have to feel the pain as well. So in the same way, whatever actions we perform, we have to get the consequences. There's no way out. It's like planting a seed, then it germinates. So if you planted a cactus seed, and then you curse God, 
Why did you make this thorny thing grow in my yard? I wanted a nice fragrant bush with nice flowers. So God will say, why didn't you plant that kind of seed? <laughs> I just provided the rain to make it germinate. You're the one who chose what seed to plant. In the same way, just like that rain causes the seeds to germinate, but what seed we plant, that's up to us. In the same way, we perform the actions, but then God gives the results. Or you can say he enables the law of karma to produce those results. It's a powerful force, the law of karma. There's an accident, four people are in the car, one is killed. One is thrown out of the car, but lands in, on some grassy knoll and lands without a scratch on them. And the other two have various broken bones. They're all in the same car crash. How is it determined? There's nothing random, not even in a car crash. Nothing random, exactly according to what was in each person's destiny, according to their past life's actions, exactly each person got. A hurricane comes and hits New York. There are two factors involved in that. One is the collective destiny of all the people living in that affected area. Then individually, what happens to each person's house and possessions and body, how much destruction, how much loss, how much pain, that is received to each person individually according to their individual karma. So the collective karma resulted in the storm coming this way and then the individual outcomes is because of each person's individual destiny according to their past karma. There's nothing random or whimsical about any of this and none of it can be blamed on God. It's all us. We do the actions, we get the results. Someone could say, then why did God even create the potential for evil? We're the ones doing evil, that's why we suffer. But why is the potential for evil even there? Why didn't God just create everything good? The answer is because God never created a thing. <laughs> You're all wondering, okay, now Swamiji's lost it. God is called the creator. He creates everything. What are you talking about? <coughs> okay, what did he create? Did he create any souls? No. Souls are eternal. If souls are eternal, how can they be created? Na sato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sataha. This is from the second chapter of the Gita. Nothing can be created if it doesn't already exist. You can take an existing thing and reform it which is what happens, that's how our body comes into being. The energy is already there, it just gets formed into the shape of a body. But you can't create energy that doesn't exist. You can't create a soul out of nothing. Even God doesn't do that. Souls are eternal. We're as old as God is. He's eternal, we're eternal. It's the one thing we can have a competition with it. <laughs> I'm as old as you are. There's no other field in which we could compete with him. Not power, not knowledge, not happiness. He's got all of that in unlimited amount. But we're as old as he is. So he didn't create us. Souls can't be destroyed or created. So we've been here forever. It means God didn't create any souls. Okay? Did God create this world? Not really. Srishti is the technical term in Sanskrit. It does not mean to create. It means, it comes from the root word srij, which means to release. Just like, let's say there's some kids playing in the schoolyard, and one boy, he has a fast hand, so there's a fly flying around, and he just grabs it. It's still alive, he just grabbed it and caught it in his hand. So then he goes up to the other children and says, you know I have magical powers, I can just create a fly right out of my hand. Oh really? Let me see. So he opens his hand and the fly comes out and everybody's impressed. Oh, he created a fly. But what did he do? He caught it and then he let it go. 
That's all God does with this universe. It's a pre-existing energy. The energy is called Maya. It exists eternally. He dissolves it and the universe is destroyed. The physical form of the universe is destroyed. The energy isn't destroyed. It just dissolves into a dormant, inactive form that God keeps within himself. And then when he wants to manifest the universe, he releases it and it again unfolds into the form of the physical universe. So again, he hasn't created anything. He brings it in and releases it, brings it in and releases it. And that cycle is also eternal. Maya never began and the cycle of creation and dissolution of the universe never began. It's been happening since eternity. So it means that God's been here forever, <clears throat> souls have been here forever, and Maya's been here forever. And Maya keeps manifesting and dissolving. So where is evil from? He tells us in the seventh chapter. Ye chaiva satvikam proktam Rajasas tamasas chaye. He says this Maya has three qualities. Keep in mind Maya is an eternal power. So eternally it has three inherent qualities. Inherent means inborn. No one gave it the qualities. The qualities are there. It's part of Maya. What are those qualities? Sattva raj tam. Sattva is the positive, good quality. Raj is in between and Tam is the bad, negative, evil quality. Those three qualities are there, like three threads. Let's say you had uh, three, uh, white, red, and black thread. And you use that to weave a cloth. So let's say then once the cloth was woven, you decided, oh no, I don't want the black thread. Take that out. Can you take the black thread out and keep the cloth? No, the whole thing comes undone. This whole fabric of this universe is the product of these three qualities, like three primary colors that combine and recombine to produce unlimited colors. In the same way, these three qualities, sattva, raj, tam, you can't even say there are three qualities of maya. They are maya. Maya is sattva raj tam, and these three combine and recombine to produce this whole thing. So our mind is made of sattva raj tam, our body is made of sattva raj tam, this mandir is made of sattva raj tam, everything that is material is made of sattva raj tam, so it has inherent good and bad qualities. That's the point I'm getting to. Everything inherently has good and bad qualities if it's a material thing. If it's divine, then it's beyond material qualities. It's perfect, perfectly good. But in this world, everything is a combination of sattva rajitam, which means that our mind also has the potential for good and evil. Did God put it there? No. It's an eternal quality of the material energy. So everybody eternally has these positive and negative qualities in his mind and it's up to us to cultivate the good qualities and in that way reduce the bad qualities. That's our choice. Through our thoughts and actions we either cultivate good or bad within us. Every thought is either taking us in a good direction or a bad direction. My point behind all of this is that God did not create good and evil. If he had created Maya, then you could again take him to court. When you created Maya, why did you put evil along with the good? He never created Maya. It's an eternally existing energy and it inherently has good and evil. So as long as this world has existed and as long as it will exist, good and evil will exist. The divine world, which is beyond this world, is beyond all of that imperfection and limitation. But this world, it's always a combination of good and bad. Sometimes we get more good and less bad. Sometimes we get more bad and less good. 
This is the world and it can never change. Put, put the idea of making this world perfect out of your mind. It's inherently impossible. <laughs> when the world is made of satvarajtam, there's always going to be good and bad in the world. But what you can perfect is yourself. By attaining God, you can perfect yourself. And then you can help others to perfect themselves. So the only thing we actually have control over is this inside here. The world is going to do what it's going to do according to people's own free will actions and the consequences that are coming to them from their other past free will actions. So our existence here in this world is a combination of our free will, which we use to perform new actions, the fact that we have to undergo the destiny because of our past good and bad actions, that affects the physical sum of the physical happenings in our life. Not every second is predestined, some things are, some things we're deciding. Our thoughts and actions are never destined, that we decide every moment. And God, where is He in all of this? He manifests the universe to give us a chance to become good. And to become even better than good, to know Him, and through that become perfect, become divine. And attain perfect happiness. He manifests the world, you know, why doesn't He just leave it in that dormant phase and let us keep resting? Because He sees... So many souls are in the divine world enjoying divine bliss. These souls are dormant because the universe is dissolved. I have to manifest the universe and give them a chance to attain me. Having manifest the universe, he also produces knowledge in the form of Vedas, Gita. He sends saints here. He himself comes here to try to wake us up. So he's doing all of that to try to take us in the right direction. But in the end, we still have free will. And with those free will actions comes the bondage of having to undergo the consequences of those actions. So as long as we live in this world, we have to keep undergoing that. But once a soul becomes God-realized, they're free from that bondage of karma. All their past actions are deleted. That's total liberation from karmic bondage. Then you receive perfect happiness. And then, even if you live in this world with all of its good and bad and ups and downs, in here you have perfect happiness and you can still operate in the world, but you operate as you were meant to operate. This is a little bit of the philosophy of the beginning of the seventh chapter. There's much more to understand and we'll have to set another date and I'll come and cover the next, uh, from chapters 7 to 12 in the next session. <coughs>